there's an order if we're wanting to see the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in and through our lives. Like, this stuff is real. I know, I know we get that. We, we thrive on being a place that believes that, and a church that believes that. So now let's, let's act it. Let's act it. With that, um, thank you. Thank you, worship team. I want to get into the word of God. I'm excited for the word of God. I, I, maybe that part of that refreshing is something that like the Lord's just kind of done in me. And um, I'm, just, I'm just feeling, I'm feeling amped. I'm feeling excited to, to be in the word of God. I, I freshly just reminded myself this week. I'm like, I love what I do. Like there's a lot of, a lot of really difficult stuff that you got to walk through as a pastor, but I love, I love getting to do this. I, do, I don't do it, um, I don't do it all, all perfect, and that's, that's all fine. I, I, I'm not looking for perfection, oh, but I, I just love this. I love getting to study the Word of God and get to share what God is speaking to me. And so we, we've been in the book of Joshua. Um, we've studied through the first two chapters in seven weeks. Now we're on week number eight. Not sure how far we're going to go. Uh, but we're going to go at least a little bit further until the Lord says, time out, time to shift. You guys okay with that? And good that we're a church that says, all right, God, whatever you want to do, we want to do. Okay, because that's, uh, that's the place that you're sitting in this morning, just, just so you know. So thus far in the book of Joshua, we've seen God prep and charge a new leader. We've seen God make promises. We've seen God show his faithfulness in making those promises come about. And then we saw last week as we got into chapter 2, we saw someone who was outside of the chosen people of God. This is good news for most of us who are not Jews, right? This is someone who is outside of the chosen people of God, the people of Israel. It's also someone who's not a man, the, the primary character of that day. It's, it's a, a woman and not of the highest stature of jobs either. She was a, a prostitute. So she went from... Uh, the least likely to being in the lineage of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And we saw how she did that. How she changed, how she changed the world was the, the message from last week. And so we saw her being attentive to God speaking. We saw her choosing to believe when others chose and not believed. And we saw that uh, her choice to believe was walked out in action. Her faith produced action in, in her life. And as she took this action, she made this promise to these spies from Israel, the not-so-secret spies. You guys remember that? Um, and so they were found out, and Rahab protected, her, uh, protected them. Um, and what was really cool is that towards the end, we saw uh, the people of Israel, those spies, go back to Joshua and they made good on their promise. I, I feel like that's something that we ought to freshly order in our lives. Making good on the words that we, that we speak. Hey, could someone just like turn on the air just a little bit? I'm like, I'm burning up. I don't know if you guys are. I was like, is that the fire, the spirit, or like what, what's going on? So maybe just turn it down to like uh, just under 70 would be awesome. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry for the interruption. But I, I thought it was cool how they, uh, they kept their promise. They were, they were good to their, their word. And uh, when they made this promise to Rahab that I'm going to save you, I'm going to save your family, it wasn't just some nonchalant verbiage that they, that they used. Right? It wasn't like out of indifference or unconcern. They said something and they were purposeful about what they said. They were men of their word. And we live in a culture today that is currently and is continually, continually moving towards this whole idea that words are cheap. I can say whatever I want, wherever I want, however I want it. People just say things, and there's no intent to actually do them. Or people say things, and there's intent to actually do them, but something else pops up, and that becomes more important. So people 
commit to things, but they don't hold regard or importance for staying committed to those things. I don't know. Do we got steel-toed boots on this morning? Can I, can I just say some things? So I'm not even talking about people who are unchurched. I'm talking about people in the church. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone like you, maybe people that look like you. (laughs) We're like chuckling out of like, okay, is this going to be a prophetic time of calling out each of our sins? No, 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 don't don't worry worry about that. Um, But it's a part of like human propensity to, to say something and not to take full meaning in, in what we're saying, and not to, not to actually intend to do that. It's kind of like this laissez-faire attitude. I'm just going to, hey, ta-da, ta-da, right? And we'll just say whatever and do, do whatever. In fact, we see this reflected in the scripture as James was talking about prayer. Do you remember how he was talking to us and teaching us about, about prayer? In James 1, he says, when, when someone prays, let them ask in faith with no, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Or that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in, in his ways. I feel like our culture just continues to move down this spectrum towards being so like, tossed around by the waves here and there in, in, in what, we're, what we're saying and what we're doing. And this is natural when we function from the flesh. When we function without submitting to the functioning of the Spirit of God who dwells within us, all who have received the grace of salvation in Jesus, we, without this, were wishy-washy, we're here one moment, we're here, we're gone the next, we're saying one thing and doing another. And this is the reason why people throughout the Bible would like, they would swear to things. And we see this like today too. I, I swear, I swear it. When they're, when they're promising they're going to they're gonna do something, right? They're, they're, they're saying, if I don't do this, I swear, I swear on this donkey, Right? And essentially what they're saying is that if I don't make good on this promise, then you get to have this, this donkey. Uh, today we may hear it as like, I, sw- I swear on my life. Uh, I swear on my mama's life. We, we've heard this one. I don't know if it's like actually okay to say in church or not, but I swear to God. We've heard it, right? We, we, it's not something I, I, I'm just making up. But Jesus says that we shouldn't live like that. Because as the culture goes one way in just being, uh, saying whatever they want, doing whatever they want, Jesus calls us to be people of our word. He came in grace and, and truth. That means we're not lying about what we're doing and what we're going to do when we make commitments. We're going to stick with those commitments. In Matthew 5, Jesus says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you can't make one hair white or black. Clearly, they don't have hair dye yet, but (laughs) the the whole point of it is like without, without chemicals, right? Let what you say simply be yes or no. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. When we live like this, this means that we recognize the power of our words, This means that we're building a culture that's a kingdom culture. We're no longer building that culture of the world. We're working towards something different. There's power in our commitments. What does this mean practically? This means that when we say we're going to do something or that we're not going to do something, we don't need to swear by anything. The people in our lives just know that 
this is a man of his word. This is a woman of her word. When they say something, they're going to do it. Our yes means yes, and our no means no. When I say I'm going to be at a meeting, I'm going to be at work, or I'm going to be at class, or I'm going to be at church, at a certain time, <laughs> when I make that commitment, we've got we've to stick to that commitment. And when I show up, this, please do not hear this in any sort of condemnation, okay? Um, when I show up, uh, even a minute late, I have just made my yes a no. And so what, how do we respond? Well, we genuinely repent. We, we genuinely say, wow, I said one thing and I did another. I don't want to live like that. And we change the way that we are living. Parents, toes, when we say, if you do that again, there's going to be consequences. And then there's no consequences. Or, and then there's no consequences on, like, on a constant basis. We're not letting our yes be yes, and we're not letting our no be no. So repent, turn it around. When I commit to God that I'm going to spend time with him daily and I don't, I make my yes a no. And so I'm just living under this fresh conviction. And I, I invite you, church, to step into this conviction too. Like, we're building a culture here. And this culture is going to be one that functions as Jesus calls us to, that we say yes, and it means yes, and we say no, and it means no. We want to change the world. We want to bring transformation. Yes, hallelujah, amen. It's got to start here. Let integrity rise in the church. And so we saw the people of Israel let their yes be yes. They made a promise to Rahab and uh, said, we're going to save you. And then they took their next step and they <laughs> followed through and brought it to Joshua. Along with this, they brought a good report of the city. Um, and the people of Israel are ready to take their next step in claiming God's promise, beginning in Jericho. And so I want to jump into Joshua chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn, turn there. Starting in verse 1, it says, Then Joshua arose early in the morning. Man, I like that. I, li I, I don't like the idea of, like, waking up early. Right? I don't like the idea of like missing out on some sleep. I love sleep. Like I really thoroughly enjoy, like thank you Jesus for sleep. Come on. <laughs> but there's an urgency this morning. There's an urgency to step towards the promises of God. There's an urgency. They didn't sleep in. They didn't wait till the day warmed up so they could stroll out in their tankinis or they had like tunics, right? <laughs> tunikinis. I, I don't know if tunikinis are a thing. Uh, it's about to blow up online, though, I swear. <laughs> so they arose early in the morning. Listen, sometimes claiming the promises of God is going to cost you some sleep. Someone better write that down. Sometimes claiming the promises of God is going to cost you comfort. Sometimes claiming the promises of God is, I don't like this one either, is going to cost you normalcy. Hmm. So they arose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim. Remember, Shittim was the place that Israel had sinned in the past in Numbers 25. They had sinned by prostitution and God saved them and cleansed them out of that. And now Shittim becomes this place where the power and the grace of God is now being sent out from. So it was a place of sin. God saved them out of that sin. And now he's sending power and grace out through that, that place. I wonder if you have any places like that in your life. Maybe in your past. I wonder if we've got any shittims in our past. That, that place where we were stuck in sin, but God. That place, that situation, we were stuck in sin and 
We called out and he answered. He showed up. He brought that breakthrough. Yeah, he, he's, got, he's got grace for, for us. And that place where God brought victory to is a place he wants to bring victory through. And so I would just even evaluate those aspects in your life where God has brought you freedom and ask the question is, is has God redeemed this yet? Is God using this to send out power and grace from yet? I always throw that word on yet because there's always an expectation that he's going to do more in the future. Write that expectation on your life. That place where God brought victory to is the place he wants to bring victory through. So they arose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Do you remember something like this taking place before in, in Scripture, where the people of Israel got to a place, and there wasn't really any place to go. They had their backs up against a, a, a water wall, if you will. And... And God, God made a way. Now, this is a, a new leader in a new circumstance, but it's an impossible situation, and it stands between them and claiming their promise. And a lot of times we will get to these places where we have impossible situations between us and the promises of God in our, our life. And as we talked about last week, sometimes what's required is we, we've We've simply got to change the world in order to see that happen. And God's in the business of world changing. But sometimes it's a different sort of impossibility. And there's a lot we can learn from the, the order or the process uh, that the Israelites go through here in this, this, next, this next stage. In verse 2, it says, At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits. This is roughly about half a mile. This would mean that more people could immediately see the Ark of the Covenant going forth. It wouldn't be just one in front of the other. I'm, I'm watching uh, the, the tunic, the tunicini, whatever, from the person in front of me marching. That's not all, all I'm seeing. Now more people, this is a really beautiful picture, so catch it. More people are now seeing the Ark of the Covenant and are now following the presence of God. This is, this is really cool. This, uh, this is almost like a, a prophetic thing I just want to declare over this, this region. That more people would, be see, uh, would see and be led by the, the presence of God. But before, before that, it says that for three days, another thing I don't like, they waited. They waited. Now, there's not a whole lot of clarity, at least from my studies thus far. I could, I could be missing something. But so far of what, what I was reading through, there's, there's not, not a whole lot of reasons um, that I understand of why they had to wait. And so I was just pondering. I'm like, why, why they got to wait? Uh, uh, why do we have to wait? I want it now. Um, I don't know. If there was a vote on things that we could not participate in and patience was one of them, I, I'd be one, like, I, I would be first on that boat. Like I, I would sail, sail away on that ship. But the fact that they had to wait um, and possibly them learning patience in the midst, which is probably something we should all be learning um, as, as we wait, is the whole patience thing, it actually makes a lot of sense in light of what's about to come next. So what comes next? It says, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant. And so what's literally being said here is this. You are to be led by something through this impossibility, and I will make a way. There's going to be something that, that leads you. You've got to be led. Are you being led? 
if you are being led, that also means that you have to, you have to actually follow it. That means you're not going ahead of it. You, you're keeping that as, as your, your guidance point. It's like a, a compass that you're, you're holding. So what is doing the leading? The Ark of the Covenant. Yeah? That's, that's leading, leading the way. What is the Ark of the Covenant? Is the presence of God. And so it's not by what you see, and think of this in your own real life, right? Right here, right now, the circumstances you are walking through, it's not by what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you feel. It's not by the strategy that you're putting together to, to move forward that you are being led. We ought to be those who are led by the presence of God. It's, it's a great part of the order of events for, for our lives, are we being led by the presence of, of God? Because that's, that's who we are. Where is this applicable in our lives? Maybe buying a house, moving cities, a new job, a new position, choosing a school, choosing a church, and a great number of other things. So what am I saying to do? I'm saying go there. Go to, go to that job site. Go to that place. Go, go to that city, go to that church, go to that wherever, and ask the question, is the presence of God here? Now, some of us, we, we know exactly what that means. We know how God speaks to us, and so we're like, oh, okay, awesome, easy enough. Uh, I try and work on these messages so that I, I hit people on all different levels. Someone who's just walking in, who's never heard anything about this stuff, and someone who's been walking for a long time. And so what, it, what does that mean when we go in and we ask, is the presence of God here? What, what, am I, what am I looking for? Number one, I'm asking to confirm, for God to confirm that I'm in the right place, that this is the right job, that this is the right person or relationship, that this is uh, the right whatever else, school. And, and then we're going to ask for the presence of God. And so for some of us, that's like a peace where we've gone in with anxiety. We're trying to figure out if we're going to make this decision to go to this school or to take this job, and we're trying to figure out if it's going to work out or not. And there's just a peace that falls on us as we step into that place. We're like, oh, that, that could be the presence of God. Maybe it's a feeling of comfort. Maybe it's visions and, and dreams. My confirmation for coming here was a vision of a key that the Lord showed me. And I, I knew that I knew that I knew that I was supposed to be here. This is where I was supposed to be. So God can give you visions and dreams, and maybe God is, God is speaking in one way or another. So the question is, do you see, feel, sense God in that place as we're seeking, on, seeking where, where to go? When you live by radical faith, it often takes you to places that you've, you've never seen. I, I love that. I, I really, really enjoy this, this type of life of stepping into the unknown, probably because it drives me deeper and deeper into this, like, dependence upon God. Because <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea what to do. I want you to move to southeast Idaho. Okay. I, most of the time, I feel like I don't even speak the language. <laughs> it's just different. But, but God, but God, and it causes me to just go deeper and deeper. God, you said, uh, I felt your presence. You manifested your presence. You showed your presence to me when I was there that confirmed that this is where you want me to be, and so I'm going to depend on you. You, you said it. All right. I, I'm, I'm going to go, and he is, he's faithful. We've got to be those who are led by the, the presence of God. I want to go one more, one more verse. I'm going to take us just a couple minutes, just a couple minutes over this morning. Verse 5. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow... The Lord will do wonders among you. Okay, here's, here's the big idea. The holy God of all creation is going to show himself 
to you through signs, wonders, and miracles. And he's, this is the same God who says, be holy as I am holy. As we're trying to understand, like, what is this concept of consecration, right? Be holy as I am holy. In order to be prepared for the manifestation of the presence of God, he's saying, make yourself holy. Normal words, unchurch words. Get yourself right. Maybe, maybe that's more understandable to some. Get, get yourself right. That's said in, in light of the, the sinful flesh of man, like you've, you've been saved, right? But now you've done something dumb. And so we repent and we accept that we've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. It's just something that we step into again. Because when we don't do that, we get to this place of condemnation where the enemy is trying to stop us from moving forward. Prepare yourself to be in the presence of God. Wash, wash over yourselves. I love this, this whole idea. Consecrate yourselves. This would be another term, uh, or this was used in other places and for the, the priests as they would step into the holy holies, the, the, the presence of, of God. They would consecrate themselves. So this is the Old Testament. Now let's move this into New Testament theology. We don't need the blood of goats, of lambs, of cows, or pigeons to see the manifest presence of God. We've already been sent the Lamb of God, who died once and for all for the propitiation of sins of all who would believe. But we've got to daily pick up our cross. We've got to daily renew our minds to the truth of Jesus Christ and not this world. We've got to be daily filled with the Spirit of God. And I want you to hear something. These things are not passive things. They're not, they're not passive. Someone was asking the question, uh, well, I've heard it a lot recently, just wondering, why is it that we don't see the power of God like we saw in the Bible as much today as they did then? Or even you look back to the different revivals of past, why aren't we seeing, we seeing that? I wonder if the reason that more people don't experience the manifest presence of God is because they're not actively consecrating themselves. It's available to you by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's given to you by the grace of God. It's not something that you've earned. It's God holding it out. Here, here, son, here, here, daughter. But these things aren't passive. They don't just happen, and hear this, they don't just happen because I said a prayer 20 years ago. So what does this look like? Here's, here's kind of, uh, let me help paint a vision. When we wake up in the morning, allowing the first words of our mouth, super practical, being Jesus. Jesus. Because he is first in our lives. Why wouldn't he be the first words off our lips? Jesus. And then praise and thanksgiving. Thank you for another day, Jesus. Worship and glorify, uh, glorify you. I thank you for the opportunity to glorify you. I thank you for the opportunity to love the world around me. And then we go into this place of, of search me. If there's anything that I, I haven't seen yesterday in my life because of my own pride or whatever, show me. I, I, I just, I want to see so that I can repent. Right? This is God's kindness, the Bible would say. It's his kindness that draws us to repentance so we don't have to be stuck. Somebody's getting out of the mud. And then we would go into this place of saying, I, I consecrate myself. In other words, I set myself aside. As you are holy, as you have spoken this identity over me, I'm going to be holy. I'm going to live a holy life. I'm going to reflect you because that's who you've made me to be. That's who you've spoken over me. And then we get up and we go transform the world because that's what we do. If there were ever a time to consecrate yourself, this precursor that we're seeing here at least, to the manifestation of the presence of God, it's now, ladies and gents. It's now to consecrate ourselves and to intentionally set ourselves and our lives and every aspect of our lives on the altar of worship before the Lord, 
that everything we do would be for him, for his, for his glory. Lori, if you would come and help me, help me close this. How are we ordering, ordering our lives? Are we ordering it such that we're allowing the presence of God to lead us? Are we putting Jesus first? Are we consecrating ourselves, consecrating our lives? You know, one of the one of the next things that takes place as Israel is going forth from this moment. They've consecrated themselves. Now they're, they're gonna walk forward. And there's this part, I'll let you read it for yourself. I'd, I'd invite you guys to read the rest of chapter, uh, chapter three. Um, but there's this instruction for uh, uh, Joshua to instruct 12 people from the 12 tribes of Israel to go, and as they enter into the water, it says in verse 13, when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from, from flowing. And so right then and there, we, saw the, we see this impossible situation now being transformed, but what did it take? What did it take? It, it took them actually stepping into the water. It, it, they, had, they had to do something with it first. It's just like when God was speaking to, to Moses and, uh, and when he told him to throw down, that, throw down the, uh, his, his staff and it'll turn into a snake. You guys remember that? And then he's like, pick it back up and it'll turn back into a staff or whatever. And, and, but he, he, he literally had to grab the snake in order for it to, like, he, he had to take the action first. And just like that with the people of Israel, they had to take the action first. So I, I just felt that, that invite from the Lord this morning, like, get your feet wet. Get your feet wet. Step into that river. Step into it. It, it looks like it's still flowing. You're, you're wondering, like, I mean, can my foot really do that? No. No. But God in you can. And God's in you. God's in you. Father, I just thank you so much this morning that you are with us. Father, I pray right now for just a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit, myself and all the people here, a fresh filling now. God, I pray that as I spoke those words that I, I believe that you've asked me to, about consecrating our lives. God, I pray that you would set a fresh fire in us to live a sanctified life, to live a set aside life, to be holy as you are holy. Lord, Holy Spirit, convict us of that. God, that we would, it's like that practical way that you're making us be the lights to our, our community. And so I, I just say, I just say yes. Just say yes to you. Say yes to you. We order our lives in the way of following after your, your presence, God. Being, being led by your presence. Of walking out in obedience when you give us direction. Even, even when it looks impossible. God, I just sense this morning that you need to, that you, you want to release some strength for people this morning who are, are pressing through it. So I pray the strength of the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. God, you are mighty. You are able. And I just speak that over our lives this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Cindy, would you send us out? Somebody needs to hear that this morning.